going anywhere. I was starting to get in trouble. And I figured I'd kill two birds with, two birds with one stone. I'll get out of town and I'll you know, do something with my life. So I joined the military. So I went down to the recruiter, signed a paper to join the military just because my friends were going in the military. I just turned 18 when I went to boot camp and became a Marine. I was 17 years old, um, getting into lots of trouble, trying to find a reason not to end up in more trouble. Uh, I had a friend uh, that was real close to me said that I needed to do something with my life. My grandfather was in the Marines and college, when I first went to college, didn't work out for me, so I figured that'd be the best bet. Russell Whitehead, United States Army, 82nd Airborne Division, 573 Cav. My name is Nicholas Stefanovic. I was in the United States Marine Corps from 2002 to 2006. I'm Aaron Gonzalez, and I served in the Marine Corps from 2008 to 2014. My name's Sergeant First Class James Goldman uh, with Oregon Army National Guard, been in for 22 years. My name is Ricky Riddle, uh, U.S. Army veteran. I served in Iraq from November 2009 to December 2012. It's uh, not like being a civilian, and it's, um, it's hard, it's uh, discipline, it's uh, uh, supporting of, of each other, it's a, it, it is a service of selfless service to others, it's about rite of passage, it's about uh, friendships, real friendships that last a lifetime. I actually really enjoyed that. Um, I was never in the same place every day. It was always something different, something new. Um, either we're in mud high, you know, chest high in water, and the next day I might be in the bone desert, you know, looking for somebody. But it was fun, and I liked it. So when you come in, you kind of leave that civilian life behind you. Uh, you start going through training. Uh, you start going through an enculturation process. There's this closeness when you stand side by side with somebody at two o'clock in the morning and uh, somebody's trying to kill you. Uh, those, those bonds last forever. I don't think uh, by and large the civilian society understand how strong that is and how powerful it is and it lasts forever. So once you go through this whole process uh, and you go to war, you change forever. You're not going to come back the same person you were when you left. different things about you, different ways you view things. Uh, it takes your innocence, your innocence is gone, whether you see anything or not. I had no idea it was in store for me or I don't even think I th thought far enough ahead to even ask myself whether I was ready to be in a war. <laughs> I, I, and I, I can't really remember exactly what I was thinking. I think we all live with this kind of false sense of security as if like bad things don't really happen in this world. You know, like we watch the news and you see riots or murders or things like that and it's almost like you're watching a movie. You leave, you shut the TV off and you walk away saying, life isn't, it's not, I don't, I won't ever have to deal with that. I, I don't think, you know, it's almost like we believe it doesn't even happen. Um, 
and I had always had that false sense of security. Um, I'd never seen violence until I, I deployed. Um, and so that, that security was, was ripped away from me at that point. It was thrown into reality. I got lucky I didn't have to pull the trigger once. I uh, got into a few small little issues that I guess I probably could have fired if I needed, but never needed to. So um, I got a few rocket attacks, uh, got some small arms fire. 99% of the time, nothing happened. But that 1% of the time, you know, it's, it's nothing like a movie. I mean, you don't, I mean, nothing can prepare you for it and you don't expect it. I mean, it just happens. And then it's over. You spend the rest of your down, downtime just trying to prepare yourself for the next time something happens. simple it was um, I mean you have a regiment you know what you have to do uh, the hardest part is just hoping that everything back home was being taken care of uh, I asked my wife you know unless it's something big you know the water heater breaks I don't want to know about it if you know if the car breaks down I don't, I don't want to know it these are, are things I didn't want to be cluttered with I wanted to be able to concentrate over there so I could do what I had to do and go home want to try to still maintain that connection, but that's not always healthy for the service member who really does need to not be involved with the day-to-day -day happenings at home when they can, they usually cannot do anything about it, right? You know, they can't have that lecture with their son who's not doing well in his algebra. You know, it's just, it's frustrating for them to not be able to act on it. So the communication of, of hearing, you know, I rely on you to help me, you know, the tire just broke down on the 405 and I had, you know, my car, I don't, I don't know how to get the jack out, what do I do, you know, you want to turn to them. And on the one hand, you know, sometimes that service member may feel good to still feel needed, you know, there may still be a place for him or her in the life of their family, you know, while they're deployed. On the other hand, it's really is important for them to be able to focus on the job. And I think that the communication that we've had is, is a mixed bag. Anybody who has been through a life-threatening event in combat in particular, combat is a transformative experience. People change. It doesn't matter whether they develop post-traumatic stress disorder or not. When you've been fired on and you are firing at other people, it changes who you are, it changes your nervous system, it changes the way you think about the world. Everybody wants to put uh a label on it, it about the, it, it was the bullets, it was the blood, it was the gore, it was the bombs, it was the explosions. And that it all ties into it, but that's, that's not all that PTSD is from. PTSD has just undergone a revision in its definition, but there are essentially um, five major parts. Um, the person has to have suffered what we call a traumatic event. That means something that's life-threatening or something that uh, threatens to crush their identity. A rape might be something like that. Um, combat is something clearly that is life-threatening. Accidents can be life-threatening as well. Um, so that's the first piece of it. Um, then there is a re-experiencing 
of those things. So it may come back in flashbacks, it may come back in nightmares, it may come back in body sensations that are simply triggered because there's a helicopter going overhead and the helicopter triggers fear in the body and you hit the deck. Um, so there's re-experiencing. The next piece of it is what we call avoidance. Um, and avo it's avoidance of things that remind you of the trauma. The next piece of it is uh, what we call negative cognitions and moods. What does that mean? It means anger, it means guilt and shame, and it means fear. It really means those three sets of things that we see. Um, and finally, there is a piece that has to do with body arousal. And body arousal is everything from insomnia and being unable to sleep because your nervous system is so jacked up, to being hypervigilant, checking everything out all around you to make sure you're safe, uh, being irritable, being very jumpy, uh, you can startle easily. In about two thirds of people, we can heal PTSD, which means that we can reduce or eliminate their symptoms enough so that they no longer have post-traumatic stress disorder. They don't meet criteria for the diagnosis. The other third of them, we can help make them better, but they develop what's essentially a chronic form of PTSD. And we are still trying to find treatments for that group of people, but we haven't solved that problem yet. So healing, we know now we can heal about two thirds. That's about the same healing rate we get in cancer. So that's pretty good, but it's not good enough. Let's just face it, we need to do better. My first experience in combat was it, it, it made me realize that, you know, death is real, violence is real. I can't call the police right now. I can't call my parents right now. I have to do what I need to do in order to survive, even if that means participating in violence myself. And I found myself having to do things that in this country are the most extreme taboo that we have in society. Uh, taking the life of another human being, there's nothing worse that you can do in our society. Um, and so all of a sudden I found myself in these situations where that's what we were in, that's, that's what I had to do. It was a very, um, just, just that, thought process alone was a little dramatic. Now we are dealing with something we call moral injury. Um, and that is when you do something that violates, uh, fundamentally violates your beliefs. Now, for a moment, any combat is gonna do that because most of us grow up with the Ten Commandments. One of them says, thou shalt not kill. And military says, you've gotta go kill the enemy. Many people are able to compartmentalize that and to say, okay, I did it, but it was a war, it's not me, the rules were different over there. And they come back and they're fine. And that is really true of most people. Most people are okay with that. But there is a subset, um, and it's a minority, that can't do that. You know, you're always on the edge and it's a catch-22 wherever you went. And the biggest one for me was having my Sergeant Major die and not being told or being told that I can't go and rescue them. And I remember my partner, Joe, um, who's a big guy, a big stocky guy, just panicking, running around, kind of scratching his head and pulling his hair out because uh, I did the one thing that we weren't supposed to do, and that's leave somebody behind. Um, and that was, I think, the key breaker for me. And, and at the time, I didn't know that. We call that survivor guilt. Um, uh, it should have been me, or if only I had been there, uh, then it wouldn't have happened. Or if only I'd have pushed him out of the way, the bullet wouldn't have hit him. Or all of those kinds of things. And it's, it's called survivor guilt. There was one guy in Iraq that, got, uh, that died from an accidental discharge of a round that he was unloading out of a uh, Bradley fighting vehicle. He was just putting, setting them in the back of a, a four-wheel drive Gator and he accidentally set one on top of another and it hit, you know, hit the firing cap, you know, cooked off another round and it 
killed him. There's nothing I can do about it. I still blame myself for it. Because I should have been there sooner. But I just took all the blame for it. I just decided that I myself were to blame. If I would have known more, if I would have been there sooner, or if you know, I hadn't stopped at the MWR, I mean, maybe he'd still be alive. I don't know. But I, I take everything very personally. And I live in the past. Lived in the past, if you will. <clears throat> I do better now. Um, I still remember a lot of things. It's not that. I mean, it's, it's just the simple fact that I've uh, come to accept the fact that it happened. And even if I knew it was going to happen beforehand, there's probably nothing I could have done. And I just, it, and now nothing will change anything. Nothing will change any of it. Survivor guilt, in some ways, is kind of like moral injury. And what I mean by that is, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's a kind of guilt that's very hard to let go of. It's, and it, a guilt that can become actually defining. And what I mean by that is, so some people say, well, if I mourn my buddy, you know, who I think I should have been there for, if I mourn him, that means letting go of him. And so I keep the pain, and I keep the guilt, and then I never have to let go of him. And so part of what we have to do is to untangle those two things. We have um, really three main populations that we see. Uh, one of the populations is a population of veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. And we're seeing a lot of veterans coming back from the Iraq and Afghanistan wars with PTSD, probably about 18 to 20 percent of them. But we're also seeing a new generation of people with PTSD. And these are Vietnam veterans who never came to treatment before and who have worked for their entire lives and now they retire. And many of them have worked for long periods of time and they worked 12 hour days and so they weren't thinking about their PTSD symptoms, they were blocking them out. And then when they retire, all of it comes rushing back in. So we're seeing two different streams, large streams of people, um, one from the recent wars and one from the Vietnam War. Coming back was um, trying to think of how if there's a word. There's not even a word to describe it, but it's a ball of emotions that um, you get from everywhere. You get from your dog seeing you, or your sister seeing you, your mom, your dad. Um, for me, it was um, kind of another thing. It was I was still in a monotone mindset. And I, it was just another thing for me. So I didn't, I didn't even think about honestly coming home. I didn't dwell on it. I wasn't, I wasn't here mentally. I was still somewhere else coming home. We flew out. Um, when was it? November, October 30th. It was October the 30th. Um, and it was big airliner flew in, and you know everybody's family was just waiting at the at uh, Pope Air Force Base in North Carolina, just north of Fort Bragg. And it was real surreal. I mean, you get off and you get formation, you get sh your hands shake by generals and sergeant majors, and everybody else welcoming you home. Then you get out in formation, and they tell you to dismiss, and you go meet up with your family. Everything was good for a couple days. I noticed uh, three days after I got home, 
sitting in my favorite restaurant with my daughter and my wife and my daughter was sitting right next to me and had my arm around her and we were talking and then all of a sudden I just didn't want her touching me and I didn't know why. I, I wanted to talk to her, I still wanted to fully engage and, and uh, my wife kept on looking at me because she knew something that didn't seem right and so she was my hero. She kind of told my daughter, well let's, let's color on this for you know right now and give dad a little bit of space. And I went home and um, went home and cried about that one. <laughs> and uh, my wife said, "You know, it's just part of, part of what it is. It's not a big deal. We'll get through it." When they tell us you don't get paid what to, uh, to think, you get out thinking the same thing, or it's just you go to work. Come home, you drink or chill with your friends, do what you want. The next day it's the same thing over and over and over. It's a set routine. When you get out, there's no routine. You make your own routine, you make your own schedule. And a lot of people aren't prepared for it. Or you don't have as much support as you thought you did. You don't have anybody to lean on or tell you what to do or what time to be here or anything like that. So you have to find your own job, your own apartment, pay your own bills, because <laughs> the Army did it for me, but it's a different experience. What happens is you've gone through this and you're all excited to get out of the service and get home. And you get home and there's high fives and hugs all around and all of a sudden, all of that stuff. Then three days later, you know, maybe grandma died, uh, your brother and sister are married and they're off doing whatever. Your parents are older. Um, nobody seems to get... Uh, you, you have that feeling they don't understand you. Uh, you can't get a job, uh, whatever the case might be. And so all of a sudden, in the midst of what was this brief happiness, you're kind of in a dark spot. You're kind of alone. Um, and then problems start manifesting themselves. Now, don't get me wrong, that's not everybody. I mean, everybody has certain things, but uh, th there's a certain part of the people that are affected more than others. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, 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 it's a hard transition. Some of the really different experiences that people have when they're in war zones um, give them a different view of the world. Also, um, just the experiences that they're, just the trauma exposure that they have to death, dying, combat, very difficult things that most civilians aren't exposed to makes a big difference. Also, as the couples are dealing with ongoing issues at home, every time, the multiple deployments has been really different in these wars, where the fact that people have deployed not just once and then come back and had a chance to reintegrate and focus, but the multiple deployments mean that every time you leave, you're coming back slightly different and you don't have a chance to really reintegrate and get to know your family that has changed now since you've been gone. And I think that's um, it's really hard for the person that's been at home to, to accept some of these differences and it's very alienating sometimes for the person who's been gone um, to try to figure out how to be happy with what's been happening at home. They don't know their kids anymore, They've, life has gone on and their routines have changed and they haven't grown together. They may have grown apart and that can be a very big challenge now too. Even when I got home after uh, my deployment uh, I still wanted to go back because you, 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 go, you go over there, you've got all these priorities, all these missions, all these uh, responsibilities, and then you come back to not a whole lot. I mean, you ha okay, if you had a job, now you come back and, you know, it depends on where you work. Now they're trying to tell you how to, how to do, you know, this job or, or whatever. Um, your family's telling you, you know what, don't worry about that, we got this. We've been doing this since you've been gone. Uh, it's not a big deal. I'll do the, you know, I'll get the lawn taken care of. I'll get the oil changes done. Um, yeah, the same guys that fix that pipe will have them fix this. And, and it's like, they, they want to take care of you. They want to give you that, you know, that space and that kind of relaxation. But at the same time, you're, you just want to accomplish something, do something. Uh, and I'm not talking something big, just something to keep your mind off of other things and keep you productive. People have to understand that everybody 
reacts to things differently. Um, you take anybody out of their home for a year, put them with a you know a bunch of knuckleheads that they hang out with and drink with once a month or whatever, and and expect them to come back normal, and it just doesn't happen. You you don't go over there and come back the same person, whether you got into an engagement, got blown up or not, it, zero relevance. You've changed your whole life structure for a year. My daughter, you know, her and I were talking and she said she was, she was hoping to, to see me go a week, you know, without crying most of the time and stuff like that. And, and uh, that, I didn't even realize it, but she said, you know, she said she couldn't stand seeing me just driving down the road and just start crying for no reason. And uh, it bothered me that it took you know, from 2011 when I got back to 2014 to find out that my daughter was seeing this and it was bothering her. We need to remember that from a family perspective, those people also serve. The veterans serve by choice. And maybe the spouse understands this because they also agreed to marry the veteran. The children never choose it. That's not, children don't get to choose the life that their parents have. So military families also serve. Now, take somebody out of their home, okay? Now the home has to change. Let's say the man gets deployed, so the wife becomes mom and dad. That's what happens. The wife becomes mom and dad, and then the kids get used to mom being mom and dad and turning to mom all the time, and yes, dad may Skype over here, but really who they have to rely on over here is mom. And then dad comes home. And dad, for dad, he's ready for it to go back to the way it was nine months ago. But the kid has changed. Nine months have gone on, and it's a long time in the life of a child. And mom has changed because she's had to be everything to the child. And now dad wants to move back in. The kid isn't just ready to jump into dad's arms and go, yes, well, everything's going to be the way it used to be. There's been a disconnect with the family and the, and the service member who has had really different experiences. So it's absolutely okay for things not to be okay. Um, it would be very unusual if there wasn't a time that was needed to kind of reintegrate and spend time getting to know each other again. It gets old fast. I mean, when you go into, uh, go into a restaurant, we went into a, a restaurant where they do all the the cooking right in front of you and so they're banging and clanging the knives and the spatulas on the steel and, and so we went to went there for my birthday in April uh, after I got home and I was doing better when they were doing it in front of me but when the table behind us was getting their food made up I was coming out of my skin because I, I couldn't see it I couldn't watch it. I didn't want to turn around sit there and stare at the family and look like a you know an idiot but it was just, it was driving me nuts. And it wasn't so much, it wasn't fear or scared. It was just, it was an annoyance. It was, you know, the banging, clang, clanging, it was just driving me, driving me nuts. And my kids, you know, they're like, well, we can go somewhere else. I said, no, I'm, I love the food here. I want, you know, we'll, we'll wait and we'll, I'll get through it. And so I had my daughter on one side hold my hand, had my uh, son on the other side holding my hand until uh, till we got our food. And, and nobody else ordered until we we're done, thank heavens. <laughs> it's not about getting over it. You've been trained to make things safe. That's what your military training has done, and that's what the trauma has reinforced for you. And so you are alerted and hypersensitized to anything that is potentially unsafe. And you don't just get over that. And you don't get over the nervous system change. The two worst things you can say to a veteran are, did you kill anybody, and why don't you just get over it? Um, because it, when you say, when somebody says, why don't you just get over it? It's a very non-empathetic position. It's saying, I don't get it. I don't understand why you're doing what you're doing, why you're feeling what you're feeling. Just stop it already. And what that says to the person is, you don't really get me. You don't understand me. You, and maybe you don't even care for me. Maybe you don't even care for me. And so it's a very difficult position uh, for a veteran to be in.
military culture trains you to be able to handle things, not to unload your emotions, your problems, your family's problems on anybody else. Uh, and it tends to make it harder and more challenging to work. I know myself, I refused to get help for a very long time because there was people that had been through a lot more than I had. And you know, if they didn't need help, then there's no possible way I would ever need help. I mean, that would just, just be unbecoming of a soldier, if you will. And uh, pride kicks in and you just gotta let pride go because you're not doing anybody any good. You're just making it worse for everybody if you don't get help. You're making it worse for yourself, which makes it worse for your family. Stigma comes at different levels. So let's start with stigma in the military. The stigma in the military is very risky because if you admit that you have post-traumatic stress disorder or really any other kind of serious mental health problem, um, you can be medically discharged. Not only can you be medically discharged, but it also is what they call a career killer. Basically, you'll never get promoted. It stops at that moment. So there is a very strong incentive, if you're in the military, not to admit that you have these problems, because otherwise your career is over. Then there's this other piece of stigma that goes with it. So if you are, um, if you're a soldier, if you're a Marine, you pull up your boots by your bootstraps. You don't tell, you don't admit weakness. You're not allowed to admit weakness. Weakness is a terrible thing. And PTSD or depression or any of those kinds of things really are, are viewed as weaknesses. And so to admit those things, to, to say those things is to admit weakness. And it's also to admit being out of control. The military training teaches you to take control. So it's very opposite to your training. So you come back to the civilian world and people say, why don't you just admit that you have PTSD already and go get some help for it and you know, get done with it. And it's not that simple because then they have to admit that they're weak, that they're vulnerable. And so uh, it's a very difficult concept to say, I need help. And the stigma really goes against the I need help. Too many people, they want to put it on, you know, combat, 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 combat. Take anybody out of their home for a year, I don't care where you put them, and then throw them back into their home. It's a traumatic event. About 30% of the families who have served since 9-11 um, came back from deployment in the Middle East with trauma, substance abuse, or other issues related to their deployment. Uh, they were not all in combat, but some uh, were close enough that they were affected. Coming home for a couple months was fine, and I believe it was about a year, maybe, maybe a year, could be less, when things just fell apart for me. And I can say I literally hit a wall at 90 miles an hour. And I don't say that proudly, but I don't hide it or deny it either. I was with the wrong people one night and alcohol got involved and I decided unconsciously that I was going to drive and I had a passenger with me, it was a Marine as well, a good friend of mine, we still talk to this day. And next thing I know, I'm physically turning a wheel, my, my driver wheel, and I'm coming off uh, the highway and I'm skidding into a wall. And then I see flashing lights behind me and there's probably about seven or eight units. And I remember getting out of the vehicle and next thing you know, I'm getting arrested and whatnot. And it just went from there. And um, I remember bits and pieces, but not fully like every, I can't give you any like a minute to minute description of what happened. 
Other than my incident in court, I'd, I'd never had any. I didn't have a speeding ticket, a parking ticket. Um, you couldn't find me in the system if you wanted to. And then I come home and I have six, seven charges all of a sudden that some people can pick up in 10 years. I picked up all in one night. And to anybody's eyes, that, that doesn't make any sense. It's like black and white. I had assault charges. I had um, resisting arrest. Um, I believe fleeing of crime, excessive speeding, um, DUI. I believe they try to get me for aggravated assault, but I'm not too sure. And I, I think there's one more. When I got out of the military, got involved with drugs, I, uh, I was in a downward spiral. I was homeless, um, not doing well. And I ended up in the criminal justice system. Towards the end, um, you know, I stopped working. I lost my apartment. And then it was just a matter of constantly trying to find money and I ended up walking into a bank with a check that was not mine and cashing it. And so I was arrested for possession of a forged instrument. I try to think back about what was going through my mind when I was, you know, I was living out of my car for like the last six months before jail. And I try to think like what, what were my plans? And I think my life was at a point where I wasn't suicidal, but I, I wasn't trying to avoid death in any way. I really just didn't care, and I did not have any plans beyond getting high and trying to find enough food to sustain me until the next day. Um, I had no goals, I had no future, I'd never even give a thought to my future. In um, late 2006, I'm presiding over a mental health treatment court. There was an individual, um, about 6'4", Vietnam veteran, which I knew was a Vietnam veteran, in my mental health treatment court. The reports I was receiving back from their treatment provider, their community treatment provider, was that they were not doing that well. I called the case and he stood in front of me his posture was slumped. Uh, he wouldn't look at me directly in the eyes. His head was directed toward the carpet, eyes directed at the carpet. And I asked him, why wasn't he really engaged in what was going on in his counseling program? And he just kind of gave a guttural response, like, uh, mm. And I said, could you take this one gentleman out in the hallway and talk to him? find out what's going on, what we could do, um, why he's not really responding and engaged. They did go out in the hallway. About 20 minutes later, they returned back into the courtroom. I see them enter into the courtroom. I asked my court clerk to uh, recall the case. When the case was recalled, this one veteran who was standing in a slump posture eyes, uh, head lowered, eyes directed at the carpet, was standing in front of me erect now with his uh, hands behind his back, feet slightly apart, standing in what is unique to military culture as parade rest. Then he looks at me now directly in the eyes and said, Judge, I'm gonna try harder. To me, it was a remarkable uh, response from someone that was really not engaged and from someone who had went into the hallway to talk to two other vets and to come back with a totally different response. So to me, I realized that something happened, and I don't know what, but something happened for us to really be able to make an impact on what's happening in society 
It's a realization that we can't just jail or imprison our way out of some of the uh, challenging social issues, but we need to address some of the underlying issues that bring people into the criminal justice. If we can get people clean, sober, those in their mental health, stable in their mental health, then we're able to have, have people be productive citizens and also improve on public safety in our communities. What probably frustrates a veteran more than anything else is when people dance around uh, issues or pretend there's not uh, a communication that needs to occur. Have the communication with that person. You're, you're not upsetting these people. These are not fragile people from that standpoint. These are people that you know learn to be bold, uh, and we pay them and train them to be bold. So have bold conversations with them. I think you're going to be much more productive. In a perfect world, what I'd like to see is that number one, we all accept our veterans and we care for them because they've sacrificed so much for us and that we treat them with the respect that they deserve and the thanks that they deserve for doing that. I, in a perfect world, we would accept them even if they have been changed by what their experiences are, we would accept them for who they are.